May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is taken from the Bible, of course, and is a portion of the epistle lesson read earlier from the book of Romans, chapter 13, the first verse, where we again read as follows the Word of, the word of God, that will be the sermon text. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating and preserving triune God. Let's get right to this text, the last part of it first. It says, the powers that be are ordained of God. And that's talking about governmental powers of every country and nation on earth. God has ordained that there be nations, that the world be divided into nations, and he has set the boundaries of those nations, and he has set governments of men over those countries that are ordained of God. It is not God's will that we be anarchists. Anarchy means no governments. But that's not the will of God. It is the will of God that we have governments to rule over us in this world. Martin Luther, in agreement of course with the Bible, said this, worldly government is a glorious divine ordinance and an excellent gift of God who has established and instituted it and wants to have it maintained as something that men certainly cannot do without. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of government you're talking about. God has ordained all different forms of government throughout history and throughout the world. Some governments are imperial, such as we read of in the Gospel lesson this morning with Caesar, the, the emperor of the Roman Empire. Some governments, on the other hand, are monarchies that are ruled by kings and queens. Some governments that God has ordained are dictatorships. Some governments are oligarchical, where you have not only kings and queens, but you've got dukes and earls and all these other forms of hierarchy. Some forms of government that God has ordained are republics. Some are democracies, and so on and so forth. But they're all, the Bible says, ordained of God. Now it doesn't matter in the Bible whether these governments are good or bad, whether these governments are noble or oppressive. They're all ordained of God for God's good purpose and reason. It doesn't matter if these governments are established legitimately or illegitimately. If they're the government of the land, they were established by, and ordained by God. As it says in our text, there is no power but of God. Doesn't matter what kind of government it is. And the Bible tells us that God has even established at times for his good purposes, cruel governments and harsh governments. We have the example of uh, Egypt in the Bible, the Old Testament. At some times, uh, the pharaohs, the kings of Egypt, were good. And they were kind to God's people. But then, God sometimes raised up unbelieving pharaohs, evil pharaohs. Uh, pharaohs who were oppressive. But the Bible says, for example, of one pharaoh, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I, meaning God, raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared, be declared throughout all the earth. And so even the evil Pharaoh, who would not let the children of Israel go from their slavery, 
God even raised him up for God's good purpose. You recall that when Jesus was arrested by the Jewish leaders uh, because they hated him and uh, Jesus would not kowtow to them, they arrested him, put him through a couple of kangaroo courts, and then hauled him into the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, because only the Romans could crucify uh, a condemned person. And so they take him down to Pontius Pilate, and Pilate uh, takes Jesus alone and, and questions him. And Jesus at one point says to this Roman governor, he says, you would have no power at all. In fact, I'll read it. Jesus said, quote, thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. So even the oppressive Roman government was established and ordained by God at that time and place. And at times, God and his infinite wisdom often sends evil governments upon a nation to punish that nation for its godlessness. But whether it's a good government or a harsh government, the point is God put it there. The Bible says, the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. Now why does God ordain governments, nations and governments? Two reasons, the Bible tells us. First of all, to preserve tranquility, so that the citizens' lives are not in constant turmoil. The Bible puts it this way, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's the first reason that God uh, ordains governments for us, that we may live a quiet and, deep and peaceful life. Because government's main job is to execute justice, fairness. The Bible puts it this way, that the government is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Or, as it says in the Old Testament, God said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And it is the duty of one of the duties of government to punish evildoers. If they murder somebody, then governments bear the sword not in vain, God says, but they are executor of justice. Now, to illustrate this, we need no further look than cities where the police have gone on strike. And this has happened often in Baltimore, Montreal, and many places. Look at what happens. There, there's no government where there's anarchy. There's no quiet life. There's no peacefulness. There is looting and rioting and, and thievery and, and fires and chaos when there is no government. Nothing but people's lives being in constant fear and turmoil. What happens when there is no government? Well, we've seen it happen, even in our day and age. They've had to call out the National Guard, finally, to bring peace and quiet back. We owe our security of our bodies and of our properties. We owe that security not to ourselves, but, but to the government over us that God has ordained and put in place. Without that government, we would have no security either for ourselves or our property. We owe our prosperity 
to the fact that there are governments that preserve law and order. Governments are a good thing. They are ordained by God, and we should thank God for it. Now, how do we thank God for our government? One, by obeying it. Obeying its laws. Uh, as it says here in our text, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. We obey the government. Uh, we especially are mindful of that today on our country's Independence Day holiday. That we are to obey the government. This is God's will for us. But we are not to obey the government. There's one exception to that. The Bible says we are not to obey the government when the government goes against the law of God. The law of God is supreme. It is over all human governments. There's examples of this in the Bible. In the Old Testament in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar made an edict for all the people of his kingdom. He said that uh, he was now God. And uh, he was going to set the religion for all his people. He was going to tell them what to believe. And to symbolize this, he, he created a statue, a golden statue. And to show that all of his people followed this law, he had them all bow down to this statue that he was going to tell them what to believe. Well, there were Jewish people living in Babylon at that time. Among them were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was their names, three men. They were believers in the coming Messiah, the coming Savior, uh, uh, the Christ. It turned out to be Jesus. And they refused this law of the king. They would not bow down to this golden statue. They would not believe what the king told them to believe. And they certainly would not believe that Nebuchadnezzar was God. They refused. But the king had also said, if you refuse to bow down and worship this statue and make it your God, then you will be thrown into a fiery furnace put to death. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were arrested and convicted of this breaking of Nebuchadnezzar's great religious law. And they were thrown into a very, very hot, fiery furnace to be burned alive. But God intervened and showed his approval of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego disobeying the government in that case. Because the law of the government contradicted the very first commandment of God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says we must obey the law of God rather than the law of Nebuchadnezzar. God approved of their disobedience to the government in that case, and he showed it by preserving the lives of those three men in that fiery furnace. The fire didn't even singe their hair. They came out just fine. In that same land later, another king arose, uh, Darius, Darius, and he made a law. And his law was, I am God. No man in my kingdom shall make any petition except to me. You can't pray to any other God. You can't make a petition to anybody else in my kingdom. You must make it to me. No more prayer. Well, there was another Christian man, a Christ believer, in that day, in that land. His name was Daniel. And being a true believer in the true God and in the coming Savior, Daniel was now 
living under this, this law of the government, the law of the king, where he could not pray to anyone but the king. And he was being watched very closely. But being a true believer, he knew the second commandment of God. Shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, which commands us to pray. Take the name of God in prayer. and Pray only to the true triune God. So Daniel continued to pray every day. And he didn't try to hide this. People witnessed it. Well, it was reported to the king. And Daniel was arrested for praying to the true God, breaking the law of the government. And the punishment was being thrown into a lion's den, be eaten alive. And so Daniel was thrown into a den of lions because he obeyed God first and foremost, rather than any human government. But God showed his approval of this, because just as he had done with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he preserved Daniel. Daniel said as he came out of the lion's den, God sent an angel to close the lion's mouths, and he was saved. God approved of that disobedience because he obeyed God first and foremost. Otherwise, if the government commands us to do or makes the law for us to do that something that doesn't contradict God, doesn't contradict the Bible or God's laws, we are to, as it says here, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers and to obey the government. So, the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than men. And otherwise obey all laws not at variance with God's law. The Bible says be subject to principalities and powers, obey magistrates. How else do we thank God for our government? Not by just obeying it, but by praying for it. The Bible commands us to pray for our government in these words. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for kings and for all that are in authority. And then we are also to honor our government. And that means we're patriotic. We don't speak evil of our country. We don't speak evil of our nation. We don't call policemen pigs. We don't call people that God has put in authority, well, they're just all crooks. That's not honoring the government that God has put in place. The Bible puts it this way, honor the king. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and so forth and so on. How safe would you be without the government, without the police? How can we call them pigs or cops? Now, there is no human being who is perfect. There is no human being who is infallible. There has only been one perfect human being. And governments are not perfect. Every government is infallible. Every government has its faults. Every nation on earth has had its faults. But I maintain, from my knowledge of history, that our nation, the United States of America, is the best on earth. Not perfect, but the best. It has brought the most peace to its citizens, 
and to the world. And it has brought the most prosperity to its people in history and in the world. God has blessed our country greatly. We should not speak evil of it. We should honor it. But that being said, we should not make government God. We should not trust it for, our, for everything, from cradle to grave, depending on our government to support us and provide for us all the time. Make government bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. God did not ordain governments to be our God, to trust in for all of our things, and to replace Him as our Lord and provider. We should not look to government as the supplier of all our needs. We should not look to government as our help in every crisis that comes down the road. We should not make government or our country a substitute for God. God never appointed the government to be that. God never appointed the government to be our savior. For that, God the Father appointed only one person, and that is God the Son, who became the man, Jesus Christ, the only perfect man who's ever lived in the history of this world. For he is also true God, become also a true man. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, before God the Son from eternity came down from heaven and became a true man in time. Before that, in the Old Testament era, among the believers in the true God, who believed in the coming Messiah, the coming Savior of the world, God gave them many reminders of this coming sacrifice for our sins, the payment for our sins. They were constantly sacrificing animals. Each one was a symbol and a reminder of the coming God-man, Jesus Christ, who would suffer and die for our sins in our place. Now one of these symbols of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament was that they would take a bull and they would take him out of the city of Jerusalem and they would slay him outside the city walls. And this would be a sacrifice for the sins of the, of the nation. And a reminder, a symbol of the coming Savior, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the whole world. But they would take him outside the city to kill him. And that's important. There's a lesson in that. What do you take outside the city? What is not fit for the city? Think of the sewer system. All of the filth that man produces. Whether it be from our kitchen sinks or our dishwashers or our showers or our toilets. All the filth and the stench that man produces. It all flows together. Where? Outside the city. To the treatment plant. Or your garbage when it's collected that you produce. Where do they take it? Do they dump it in the town square? They take it outside the city to the dump. Nobody wants to go there. Well, that is like God looks upon our sin as our filth that we produce every day and our thoughts, words, and deeds, our disobedience to his commandments. We have sinned. We have produced filth and stench in his nostrils, the Bible says. And so he says, his Savior that he sends, Jesus Christ, God the Son, true God and true man, he will be taken out of the city, and there he will be sacrificed, because he's not fit for the city. He stinks in the nostrils of God, because he became the sin of the world. He was made to be sin, the Bible says. 
the sin of the whole world wasn't fit to be with us. They took him outside the city and crucified him, just like that bull in the Old Testament. And so Jesus paid and atoned for all of our sins. He died, he suffered, he was forsaken of God so that we would never be. So that God would not forsake us for our stench and our sin. He took our place. He fulfilled God's justice and wrath upon our sin for us. Trust in Him as your Savior, not in man, not in yourself, not in your own supposed goodness. Trust in Jesus Christ, the perfect man, the God-man, who took upon Himself all of your sin, took it outside the city, and paid for it all and cleansed you. And not only that, to prove that this is all true, he rose from the dead on the third day and was seen by hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses alive after he had died and was buried. That proves it. All of it is true. Jesus is God come to save us. Our creator died himself for us because he loves us so much. He'd rather die himself, himself than see us die eternally for our sins. I tell you this today, if Jesus Christ had never risen from the dead, if he had not been resurrected on the third day and alive, I wouldn't believe in him. I wouldn't believe in him anymore. I believe in Aristotle or Socrates or any philosopher or any teacher. But because Jesus rose from the dead, that's why I believe him. He is our God. He is our Savior. He is worthy of our trust. This is the faith that founded this country, that founded the United States of America. There was a famous Swiss zoologist and geologist back in the 19th century, Jean-Louis Agassiz, and he came back then to visit the United States at the age of 38. And he was so impressed with this new country, this United States of America, he was so impressed with it that he went back to Switzerland and he wrote these words, quote, the American continent was the first created. It will be the last in the fulfillment of the designs of the creator. God has in store for you who people it the accomplishment of admirable results. The foundation of your people is the Bible, the book that speaks of God, the living word of Jesus Christ. In an admirable manifesto from your president, there shines through his words the Christian faith, a belief in Jesus, is at the root of this nation. And when I return, I shall tell Europe that I have found here liberty associated with Christianity and have been among a people who do not, who do not think that to be free, they must be parted from God. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Obey the government when it does not contradict the law of God. Pray for our government. Honor our government. But trust only in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.